Hello and welcome to a GCSE History revision tutorial. We're going to be looking at some paper one material and we'll be looking at approaches to prevention and treatment of illness from 1700 to 1900. Looking at some key individuals, Simpson, Nightingale and Lister and two key pieces of government legislation, the 1848 and 1875 Public Health Act. So before we get going, here's some tips on how to use this presentation. You might like to go and get yourself some paper or some flashcards, and you'll be using these maybe to make some notes on. At the end of each slide, you can pause the presentation and try to summarise each bullet point with two to three words maximum. And then when we're done, review and memorise your flashcards and then maybe later watch the video again and tick off your flashcard notes as you hear them discussed for a second time. So here's the big picture for approaches to prevention and treatment from 1700 to 1900. You can see on our timeline that we're highlighting Louis Pasteur's germ theory in 1861 as a key moment so we'll be looking at James Simpson's work on anaesthetics, the 1848 Public Health Act, Florence Nightingale's work with hospitals and nursing, Joseph Lister's work on antiseptics, and finally the 1875 Public Health Act. As you hear about each of those developments, you might like to consider factors that are either hindering change, getting in the way, stopping things getting better, and factors that are promoting change and improvement. So on the hindering side, issues such as laissez-faire and vested interests in government which came together to prevent change, surgeons' opposition to changes, and lastly the limiting factor of a lack of knowledge of the true causes of disease before 1861. And then on the plus side, maybe look for the importance of government again, when the working class get the vote, developments in science, particularly germ theory being important in promoting change, the work of key individuals and their brilliance, and maybe also the factor of war Florence Nightingale's fame came from war and she used that in some of her work. OK, so let's turn firstly to James Simpson and his use of chloroform. The importance here is that this, for the first time, meant that anaesthetics were effective in surgery. So before Simpson's work there was no reliable general anaesthetic and that resulted in surgery being performed in fast, brutal conditions. It also limited the range of operations that could safely be done. So many patients would die of shock. And Simpson, using a trial and error technique, went in search for a chemical that could provide effective general anaesthetic. So that's knocking the patient out completely. And you can see him in the bottom picture, uh, what happened when he discovered chloroform. Uh, he passed clean out and uh, only woke up some time later. His profession was midwifery, which of course made him very interested in pain relief. Now his impact here is that pain relief in operations becomes entirely possible. It meant that surgery could be performed more slowly, more carefully and that deeper surgery happened. However, when um, effective anaesthetics were possible, this leads to what we call the black hole period of surgery, where death rates actually rose because surgeons slowed right down and attempted more complex operations, which led to complications around infection. Now you can see the bottom two points are in red. We'll do this for each of our slides and these will show you maybe some of the possible limitations of the um, individuals and developments that you'll look at. So for Simpson, a possible limiting factor 
is that there were some overdoses in the early years of chloroform. More nervous patients tended to gulp down the chloroform, which would tend to, uh, which could lead them to overdose. A famous one is a fatality in a um, ingrowing toenail operation. And also, he faced opposition from some surgeons and the church, which slowed the adoption of chloroform until um, Queen Victoria used it and, uh, and promoted the use uh, of the drug. OK, let's look at the 1848 Public Health Act, which encouraged change, but crucially did not enforce effective change. So before the 1848 Act, Britain was swept with um, repeated epidemics of disease, cholera being a key one. And any attempts to reform were undermined by the attitude of laissez-faire, where the government didn't see it as their job to provide welfare, and also by the vested interests of their voters. They were accountable to only the middle and upper classes, who would be the very people that would have to pay large sums of money in taxation for any improvements to sanitation. And so previous recommendations such as Edwin Chadwick's 1842 report that had um, suggested developments in sanitation had been rejected. So the 1848 Act focused on sanitary conditions, on issues around water supply, drainage and effective sewage. They set up boards of health, but crucially, the act was voluntary. Local councils did not have to um, adopt it. And so its impact is limited. It weakened, but did not end laissez-faire. There were limited improvements in some towns, but it was ignored by most as it was voluntary. And if you look at the date, you can see this is before germ theory. So the importance of effective sanitation was not fully understood. OK, so let's have a look at Florence Nightingale and her work with hospitals. Now I've given her the date of 1854. Now that's because at that point she had returned from the Crimean War. Now in your work it's important that you focus only on her work in Britain that's what's important to us in our course. So before Nightingale, nursing was a low status profession. Nurses were held in low regard. It was seen as a fairly base occupation. There were poor conditions in hospitals and very limited and haphazard uh, training for nurses, if any at all. So Nightingale, when she returned from nursing in the Crimean War, where she had achieved national fame and was a heroine for improving conditions in Scutari Hospital, used her profile to influence the government. So she wrote nursing manuals and she established nursing colleges and she advised the government for a long time on hospital design. Now, she's around for a long time, so um, we need to consider that part of her importance is that she, um, that she influences government for so long. And her impact is that as a result of her recommendations, hospitals were cleaner and better ventilated, and the status of nursing improved rapidly. Throughout her life though, she did reject germ theory, so she based her work uh, around miasma, even after germ theory had been published. OK, so let's have a look at Joseph Lister's work with antiseptic surgery. So before Lister's work, death rates were high and rising. The black hole period of surgery had resulted in even some common operations having staggeringly high death rates. For example, nearly 50% of operations for broken legs um, ended with the patient dying. Now often these deaths were the result of post-operation infections. So this was a crucial area. So what Joseph Lister did was he applied Louis Pasteur's germ theory to surgery. So Lister was aware that carbolic acid was used in sewage treatment and he applied the techniques from that industry to surgery. 
So as you can see from the bottom image, during operations, a fine carbolic spray was pumped out over the patient, and this um, killed the germs that were present. As a result, death rates in surgery fell rapidly, and Lister's work was further developed by himself and by others over um, subsequent years, over decades, to achieve aseptic surgery. But this is the first step to the um, to countering germs in operations. However, Lister did face some opposition. So carbolic acid um, was a fairly harsh chemical. Surgeons' hands were chapped um, and would often be bleeding after sustained use of carbolic acid. So some surgeons opposed it. And also some opposed it because Lister's presentation of his ideas was sometimes a little confused, a little bit haphazard, particularly when he um, attempted to improve his ideas in later years, which led some people to accuse him of not knowing exactly what he was about. There was also slow take-up because his work was based on germ theory and that in itself was, um, was often opposed in its earliest years. OK, so finally, let's have a look at the 1875 Public Health Act. So the 1848 Act had really failed to improve conditions, but this uh, was to change. Working class men had got the vote some seven, eight years before this, which removed the vested interest of voters. So now politicians were answerable to a new electorate. And also, Louis Pasteur and John Snow uh, with his work on cholera in London, had shown the importance of sanitation and what could be achieved. And the 1875 Public Health Act had some crucial differences. The most important one was it was compulsory. It had to be done. So that meant that the um, local councils across the country had to take the measures that were dictated to them by central government. So medical officers, and sanitary inspectors were introduced, sewage and effective water supplies were provided and there was also a focus on improving um, housing. And the impact was important. There were rapid improvements in basic sanitation, rapid improvements in housing conditions and you can see that this has finally weakened the idea of laissez-faire and the government now saw itself as much more accountable for public health. But a limiting factor here is that of course there was plenty of bad housing already in existence in the slums, whereas the new housing that would be built would be better, poverty and bad housing continued because they were already there. OK, so you might like to take this a little bit further. Here's a practice question that you can have a go at. And now what you might notice in this um, question is that it asks you to consider across two different time periods. And that is a move that examiners can make. So it might be a good workout to have a go at comparing the role of the government in the period that we've looked at, 1700 to 1900, to another period and we'll go from 1900 to present. And in its form here, this would be a 16 mark question, so that would require our usual introduction, three topic paragraphs, and our usual three part conclusion. There's guidance on how to do those 16 mark questions in our other presentations on this channel. OK, we're at the end. Thanks for watching. Good luck with your revision. You'll find plenty of other guidance, of course, on the CHSG History Channel.